So, um, two exercises today, ubiquity microorganisms, which we just set up and put away in our incubators, and we'll look at our results next week. Um, we're going to introduce the light microscope, and you'll actually use the light microscope next week. Uh, and we're going to talk about the importance of controls, um, which is covered in lab six of your lab manual. And so, by definition, a false positive would be when your control has a positive result, but you expected a negative result. So in the case of our plates, right, for today's experiment, we expect no growth, right? It's a problem if we get growth. So the best example as far as testing that most people understand pretty well is pregnancy testing. So that's the example that I'll use today for all of these. So if you observe a positive result but you're expecting negative, right? So you run a pregnancy test, right? And it comes out positive but you don't think you're pregnant. Even worse, you're a guy and you did it out of sympathy for your wife and peed on the stick too and it came out positive. Is there any way you could be positive for a pregnancy if you're a guy? Yeah. It's not that movie Twins. It doesn't really happen yet. Okay. So, how the heck did this happen? Well, it happened because of how this test works. And actually, nowadays, I don't know if it was a sympathy thing that a guy actually peed on a stick, but they actually found that when men come up positive for the pregnancy test, it's an early indicator of testicular cancer. <laughs> for some reason, something that's produced when you have that particular type of cancer and it shows up in your urine, it will test positive on the pregnancy test. So they're actually starting to use that test as an early detection uh, test for men and testicular cancer. That one's such a tongue twister for me, I don't know why. So, but that has to do, again, with the specificity of the test, something we'll talk about in a moment. But do we want false positives? No, because that means there's something wrong with our test, right? And it's not giving us an accurate result. False negatives are bad news too, right? So, what if you're pretty sure you're pregnant? What if you really want to be pregnant, like when I was trying for a year and a half? Right? I was so excited when that thing up came up positive, I took a picture of the darn thing. Right? <laughs> um, but what if it's negative? Right? And you really, really, and you expect to be pregnant. You haven't had your period in two months. How is it that it's negative? It has to do with the sensitivity in this case of the test. Right? So can you get false negatives? Can you take a pregnancy test and be negative and actually be pregnant? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Unlike in the movie Juno, right? This is a pretty specific test, though, for pregnancy. If it comes out positive, don't take 12 more tests. I think she only did, like, three more. But anyways, it, they're all going to come out positive, right? Figure out what you're going to do about that. If it's negative, it does not mean you're not pregnant, It has to do with the sensitivity of this test and the type of sample that you're using in this test. So what are you testing for in the pregnancy test? Anyone know? Hormone. Human chorionic growth hormone, which is usually only produced when someone is pregnant, right? Or unless you have some other complication that's causing your body to produce that specific hormone. It is produced and it travels through your body in your bloodstream. But excess hormones are filtered out and end up in your urine, right? All your toxins, all your excess medications, acids, bases, all end up in your urine to get them out of your body. So that's why you can use urine to test, right? Because excess is going to end up in your urine. But you have to be far enough along your pregnancy that you're producing enough that enough spills over into your urine that it's detectable by this test, right? So that deals with sensitivity, right? And they've really increased the sensitivity of pregnancy tests. You can use them much earlier than you used to be able to. A much more sensitive test would be if you went to the doctor and they drew blood, right? Because the blood is going to have a much higher level of human chorionic growth hormone in it earlier in pregnancy than your urine. So this is within the detectable range, right? Sensitivity is within detectable. 
So sensitivity is what's going to a lot of times give you false negatives, where you're in fact positive, but the test isn't sensitive enough to detect it, right? It isn't strong enough to deal with just tiny quantities. It needs much larger quantities to show that positive result. And there are a positive control built into pregnancy tests, right? If you look at the strips, there are two lines that will form if you're pregnant. One is the positive control to let you know what? The test is working properly. The other is your unknown sample. If there's a line, it's detecting that hormone, you're probably pregnant. Got it? If you have no lines, that means what? The test didn't work. If you don't have that positive <laughs> control, the test isn't working. If you have that positive control and no line for your test sample, then it didn't detect the hormone. But if the test doesn't work at all, right, then obviously you got to redo it. So controls are very important, right, and help us control the parameters and know that tests are working properly. Specificity is that whole problem, like how does a guy become pregnant, <laughs> right? And this has to do with, again, how the test is run. It uses antibodies that will be able to bind to that particular hormone. But apparently that, and I haven't done any research into this, but whatever it is that guys are producing, that antibody is able to bind to it. Um, and that's why they're getting these positive results. Um, so there's an issue with the specificity. How specific um, that test is for testing for the specific chemical you're looking for. And so you hear about this sometimes with drug testing, right? Where certain things can also give you a positive result and it isn't actually an illegal drug that you've been taking. And this is that cross-reactivity that can happen and, of course, generate what we call false positives, which you definitely don't want when it comes to drug testing. Does that make sense to you guys? For the uh, specificity for mm -hmm. the guy, mm -hmm. so it's not that the guy's producing the human... It's human not that the guy's producing human chorionic growth on, he's, he's producing something similar, yep. So we have one test that we run in this lab called the catalase test. And if you don't do the procedure properly, the metal loop that we use to transfer our organisms could cause that reaction to happen. And so you don't know if it's your organism that's causing the reaction or the metal loop. All right, so it's important to follow the protocol correctly for running that test. Otherwise, you'll run into a specificity uh, problem. All the other tests we, we typically run, it's sensitivity issues. Do we have enough of the product for us to see a positive result? So sometimes you'll get some false negatives because it's, it's, not, um, it's not incubated long enough or you don't have enough of the product in the, what you're testing. So in addition to controls, sometimes standards are needed. Controls are very valuable when we're asking a yes-no question right? Is it positive? Is it negative? These are qualitative tests. And so these really help us know the reliability of our unknown samples, what we're actually testing. Sometimes we need a little bit more information. And in that case, we need standards. Standards will help us quantify, actually get a number of a range for our positive results and negative results. So typically we'd use an extra piece of machinery which we do have in this lab and we are in the process of developing our last lab um, where we do a test that's very similar to pregnancy testing. This type of technology of using antibodies to detect the presence of either antibodies or other substances like hormones and drugs and things like that. Um, right now we do it qualitative, yes or no. We want to change it to quantitative, where you'll actually get a number um, for the positives. And we use a spectrophotometer to do this. And this is a machine that can measure the different um, intensities of color that are produced by these assays. So when I worked in research, I ran 
um, these assays on um, blood samples from the armadillos that we purposely infected with leprosy. And we were looking at their antibody level as they progressed in the disease. So I wanted a number of antibodies, what we refer to as a titer. Sometimes those of you guys that are getting ready to go to nursing school, if you don't have up-to-date vaccination records but you know you've been vaccinated, they'll order a titer. And this will tell them how many antibodies you have against what it was you were vaccinated against. So these type of tests are, are very useful, right, because they can give us a little bit more information. And, and that way, depending on those levels of antibodies, you may have them, but you might not have as many as you need to have. So they may suggest that you get a vaccination booster. Or in the case of the research that I was doing, I knew that that animal was getting very close to the end of the disease state, and we may need to harvest its organs soon before it died, and we wouldn't lose those bacteria that we've been growing in that organism. Because microbacteria will not grow in artificial culture. So they would use armadillos, which get the natural infection just like we do. Um, or they would use nude mice foot pads, which again are really small. The nude mice do not have a functioning thymus. Um, they live like the bubble boy lives. Their immune system is compromised because of their thymus not working properly. So they live in these sterile cages. Um, and their foot pads get enormous when you inoculate them with uh, mycobacteria leprae. Uh, because their immune system can't kill off the bacteria. Uh, so we can grow really large numbers for a study. So in order to be able to do these type of tests where we quantify, we have to have a standard, a known set of concentrations to work with. So this is an example of a protein assay a colleague of mine used to do. So he had known concentrations of the protein, 4 micrograms, 8, 12, 16. And then he ran it on the machine, and the machine gave him these different absorbance numbers. And so then he could graph it. He could graph it linearly with a straight line, which, as you can see, doesn't hit all the dots. So that wouldn't necessarily be as accurate, but it depends on how accurate your information needs to be. Or you can do a different equation where you match up the lines. The good news is that unless you're a mathematician and you like doing this stuff for fun, there are computer programs that will calculate these things for you, right? I never had to do this by hand using these formulas. I always use the computer. You could take your unknown sample and run it on the machine. You'll get that number from the machine, machine this absorbance on the spectrophotometer, and then matching it up with your known data, your standard curve, you could calculate what that concentration would be. And again, depending on which curve you're using or the line, you'll get different values. Oops, where's my value? There it is. So you'd get 77.1 micrograms, right, was in his sample. No, that's wrong. There it is. That's the other side, right? Um, this side, because it actually makes a parabola, you'd actually go by this side. It's 7.21 micrograms, right? If you look here, just before 10. So that's why I was like, the 77 does not make sense. <laughs> Let <laughs> me think about that for a second. But that's important, you know, if you remember um, algebra, right? There's the two sides. You have to make sure you know which answer is the correct answer. So in your lab, you nearly have these cute little uh, smiley faces, right, and a diagram, a different way of representing the same information. 
right? Um, these are the results you get. These are your expected. So if you get positive, positive when you expected it, that's a true positive. You're happy, right? Um, if you got a positive result and you expected a negative result, you probably have a sensitive a specificity issue, right? Something made it positive that wasn't supposed to in your test, right? Something from the guy is reacting with the, with the antibodies that are detecting for women, a different substance. In the case of a false negative, right? Um, where it's negative, but you actually expected a positive result, that's usually a sensitivity issue. Again, you don't have probably enough of the substance to get a nice, strong, positive result. And that's where, like, something like a quantitative assay, you could see, like, for me, for the armadillos, like, 700 was the number for us, um, where they were, were what we considered positive. They, they, they significantly were, were starting to progress in the disease. And they'd get up into the thousands there towards the end. Uh, but some of them would come up at like uh, 650, right? And I would know, okay, well, that's uh, if I had run the test a different way, that would be negative. But this tells me a little bit more that, oh, you know, he does have antibodies. He is progressing. Where if I just did a yes or no, all I would have got was no for him. And I would have been like, okay, put him aside. You know, maybe it didn't work for him. You know, unlike someone else who's only at a 400, I'm going, well, it may not have worked for him, right? Maybe he's not going to come down with the disease, right? Someone at a 650 is getting towards positive, right? A thousand, I'm watching him, you know, daily, coming in on the weekends, make sure he doesn't drop dead on me. Make sense? So sometimes you need that little bit more accurate information. And of course, we can mathematically calculate these. Unfortunately, the formulas in your lab manual are wrong. We have submitted this to the editor. I don't know why it hasn't gotten fixed. Um, they're usually pretty good. Um, these were fours instead of equal signs at one time. <laughs> they did fix that. Um, but this bottom equation is wrong. Um, it should be, um, I forget what they have, but I've corrected it in the copies that I, I think I gave you guys, right? So, again, we don't want any false positives. That's what gives us problems with specificity. And we don't want any false negatives. That's going to give us sensitivity issues. So some terminology. What does ubiquity mean? Everywhere. Found just about everywhere. So where can you find microorganisms? Everywhere. This lab is titled Ubiquity of Microorganisms. Are we going to find ones in the air? from our hands, on our desktop, on our cell phone, in our mouth, in our nose. Yeah, all these plates are going to grow, right? It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Which plates do we hope not to grow? Our negative controls. So what's a pathogen? Yeah, it's, it's something we know will cause illness. Typically, we talk about organisms, but nowadays we know about viruses, which aren't organisms. They are pathogenic as well. They can make you very sick. What does non-pathogenic mean? Well, non is opposite, right? But this one is a tricky one because, like with science, we don't have these black and white conditions, right? Um, this is the gray. So this one is the organism is not known to cause disease. We might discover tomorrow... It does, right? Just like the pregnancy test. It might come up negative, but you're pregnant. Okay? So we may think it doesn't cause a disease today. Tomorrow might be a different story. So we don't say definitive typically when we say no. We say, not right now. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Opportunistic pathogens, so they need something, right, to be bad guys. They're not always bad guys. They're bad guys when the opportunity arises. And so the most common opportunistic pathogens we deal with are what are referred to as enteric bacteria. This is the one, this is a common informal name given to the microbes that, in, that are in our intestines. Enteric referring to your gut. 
So E. coli is the most common one that most people are familiar with that's in your intestines. And it can be pathogenic depending on where it is. So little girls are taught when we're very young how to properly wipe after you go to the bathroom number two. You always wipe towards the back because if you wipe front, you're going to pass two holes that you do not want poop in. They're called the vagina and the urethra. A little girl in Louisiana several years back died of something that simple as not wiping properly. Got organisms from her gut into her urethra, into her bladder, upper ureters, and destroyed her kidneys and killed her before her parents realized how sick she was. Really, not kidding you. So look, to you guys that tuned me out, you might have to take care of a little girl someday. You want me to repeat it? You got it. Guys don't have that problem, right? Only two holes separated by a relatively long distance. You'd really have to work at it to get it in the urethra. Usually not a problem. So glad I have a little boy. Then you have the other problem. They pee everywhere. <laughs> So one of my students who wasn't watching his little boy one day, who was around two at the time, walked into the room and there was poop everywhere and the child was eating it. What? Yes. He's like, Miss Erica, I do not understand. He did not get sick. I said, well, he just ate it, right? He's like, yeah, he ate it. And I was like, well, it was his poop. He just put it right back in. It's pretty much usually okay when it's your poop. It's when you get exposed to other people's poop that may have stuff in it that could make you sick, that you run into problems. Animals all the time eat their mom's poop. This is how they establish their microbial environment. Horses, cows, you don't stop them. They actually encourage them to do so. <coughs> Cats and dogs will sometimes do it, and that is... For them, it's still, you don't completely digest all your food. And if you have a condition like my mom's dog did before we figured it out, she wasn't able to digest her food. Her pancreatic enzymes were not functioning properly. Her food was going in one end and right back out the other without digesting it, without getting those nutrients. So she kept eating her poop. Um, for them, it still smells like food. So that's why they typically will eat it. Um, but it could be an indicator that something's wrong, too. Uh, so get them checked out. Or pick it up so they don't eat it. Because that's gross. They get potty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but it's when poop gets to other places, into wounds, right? Um, into your um, urethra, right? For women, the vagina. That's bad news, right? Because... Those, that parts of our body have different nutrients um, and those organisms will grow differently and our immune system will respond to them differently. Host. So when you're a host, everyone comes over to your house, right? <laughs> so when you're a host, everyone comes over to your house, right? You are the home. If you are the host, you are the home. You're the habitat for organisms other than yourself. This relationship can be parasitic, which of course we do not want. That means that you are harmed by someone else living with you. Yep, that's called a child. <laughs> They're an endoparasite and then they become an ectoparasite. No, it's not all negative. I'm joking. <laughs> they make up for the negative moments. And I'll tell you, when you become a mom, you'll thank your mom or your dad all the time. <laughs> I'm like, Mom, how did you do it? <laughs> you had three. I have one. It's the impossible mission. Communal relationship is one in which, and I believe this one probably doesn't really exist, is where both organisms are living in the same home, right? Um, and... Neither one is benefiting or affected negatively. This is what they call communism, too, help you remember it, right? Where everybody's supposed to get equal, 
Nobody gets more or less. I don't think that's possible, but who knows? Communalism might really exist. <laughs> Mutualistic, on the other hand, definitely exists. The, that good old E. coli I talked about, the non-pathogenic kind that's in your gut, you're feeding it, you're giving it a place to live, and it's producing vitamins for you, like vitamin K. So you are benefiting from that, and so are they. So both sides benefit. Both have a positive relationship. And how I remember mutualistic sounds like marriage, right? If you're in a good marriage, that is. Both partners should benefit. Otherwise, you know, divorce papers show up. Communal is like communism. Everyone's supposed to get equal. No, no negative, no positive. Reservoir. So this again is, has to do with a place, right? So humans, we put ourselves on a pedestal, right? Even though we are animals, we tend to put ourselves in this whole other category. So any animal, right, other than humans, so non-human hosts or site in nature that serves as a perpetual source of pathogenic organisms. So these are animals and places we want to avoid, right, because they are source of pathogenic organisms. So for rabies, who's number one, leave them alone in Louisiana? My lecture class students already know this answer. What animal do you leave alone? Raccoons. Very high infection rate in Louisiana for rabies. It's in the 90 percentile. Yeah. Water even, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not drinking the Mississippi. Not, fil not without filtering it first. I ate dirt pies as a kid, even with jimmies, which are called ants, because where I grew up, they weren't fire ants. It won't necessarily kill you. The good news is no cat or dog from the neighborhood had pooped in my mud pie. <laughs> We are sometimes a little too clean in the United States, right? People that live in Africa, tribal people that roll around in the mud, have a much more diverse microbial population in their guts and their bodies, and have less diseases because of it. We isolate ourselves and expose ourselves to very little microbes because we're really afraid of the bad guys. But that also keeps us away from the really good guys. And that's why, you know, probiotics and things like this have become very popular, right? So that we can, in a sterile way, eat only the good guys. Free living, just as it implies, they don't really need a home or an, another organism to survive. The good news with these guys is they tend to be non-pathogens. Pathogenic organisms really usually rely on a host or a particular environment in order to survive. So why did we incubate our unopened plates? What's the purpose of these plates? What's in these plates? We didn't even open it. What's in those Petri dishes? The agarose, that, that solidifies it, but then also food, right? In this case, it's beef extract, and then the blood agar plate actually has whole red blood cells in it as well. So it's food for the organisms. Before we start, we want this to be sterile, right? Which means no microorganisms are in it. So what's our appropriate level, label for these plates if we do not expose them to anything? Control, control but there are more specific. There are negative control in this experiment or no exposure. What are important labels that we put on all our stuff we generate in lab? The temperature, the date. Not necessarily the time. What the sample is, right? In this case, negative control. Are we the only class in this lab? No, you might need to indicate your class or your name, or both. 
Yeah, which one did we just say? 37, bottom shelf. Thank you. Push the button. Yep. So where do we label our plates? Always on the bottom because that's where the food is. You could easily switch those lids, right? I could be really evil, right, and do that to you. We want it where the organisms are going to grow, and they're going to grow where the food is, in the bottom of the plate. Notice in this example I wrote along the edge. We didn't do that today, but typically you'll you do that in a lab so that you can easily see what grows on the plate. If growth appears on both unopened plates, what are some likely explanations? What happened? Yeah, the media wasn't sterile to begin with. It became contaminated. The person preparing them didn't do it properly. They accidentally got opened. If we were in a research or clinical lab and we get growth on those control plates, what does that mean for our experiment? We got to start over. But this is a teaching lab, so we will not do that. We will learn from that. We will talk about that. What if it appears on only one plate? How does that affect our reliability, our interpretation? Now remember, what, what are, what's the difference between our sets of plates? Temperature. So the contaminant might have only been one that grows best at one of the temperatures and not both. Right? But still, that still puts our whole experiment in question, right? Because there's obviously some type of contamination there. And we also, say the ones in 37 grow. Do we know then from his mouth that that's actually what we're looking at or the plate was contaminated? We don't, do we? Right? Hence why it, it invalidates our experiment if our negative controls don't come out negative. We have to start with nothing. So that the growth we know came from our hands, came from the tabletop, came from the air. If we don't start out with nothing, with sterile plates, we don't know what we're looking at. So here's some pictures, and we asked the question, why did we choose all these things? And your lab manual asked for some other things like hair and someone to cough. We don't get re good results with those, so I've changed them out <laughs> for different samples. But, but why did we do all these? Our fingers, the desktop, the cell phone, the air. What's the title of this lab? Ubiquity. Ubiquity. We're trying to prove that organisms are everywhere. And also to make you guys aware of the possible sources of contamination when we start working with our organisms, right? Like I said, a lot of times I'll hold my breath, right? you got to hold that dish lid over the dish so that you don't airborne contaminate, stuff fall out of the air onto your plate. You're going to learn in two weeks a proper aseptic technique to try to do without contamination. Sometimes also referred to as sterile technique. So, as you can see, whole lots of growth, right? This growth is what? What are those fuzzy things? Mold, right? So, as I say, mold spores can land, right, on this food source and grow. We know this is that fu fuzzy stuff. Um, the other stuff that's relatively smooth is probably bacteria, right, um, growing on the plates. So, we'll see all different colors and textures and... Uh, cool stuff next week. If it has a lot of mold, I'll tape it shut. Uh, we won't actually open it because when you do that, it'll usually release its spores into the air and we don't want to do that. So we talked about 25 versus 37, right? 25 is room temperature, 37 is body temperature. We use it a lot in this lab, right? Because body temperature is what most of the pathogenic organisms would be happy at, at. So Celsius scale is what those are written in, is based on the properties of water. Zero, water freezes, which is 32 Fahrenheit. At 100 degrees Celsius, water boils, which is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. We've already said that 25 is around room temperature, which would be about 77. I would prefer like 70, but hey. 
Beggars can't be choosers. 30, uh, the reason why we have that is about 86, which is usually about soil or skin temperature. Remember, 98 is your core body temperature, right? Your body is actually cooler at, it, at, at its extremities, normally. Uh, and then core body temperature of 37. So what is likely the source of organisms that grew best at 37? Us, right? If it grew best at 37, it probably came from us, right? Because it'd be happier body temperature. So how do you think they survive at room temperature without nutrients? So you cough on the desktop, right? You sneeze on it. Do microorganisms get on it? Yeah, do they survive on there? I don't know, you can get sick from touching something somebody sneezed or coughed on, right? You can get the flu virus, you can get uh, tuberculosis. The truth of the matter is there actually are some nutrients there you're not aware of. And microorganisms are very good at starving. So even if there isn't a whole lot of food, they're okay with that for a little while. And then some of them can form dom dormant cell types called endospores, right? Where they can go into a resting state that allows them to survive in harsh environments for extremely long periods of time. We call these endospores. Anthrax can do it. Tetanus can do it. Botulism is caused by a bacteria that can form endospores. Tetanus is highly prevalent in the soil in our environment. That's why you should get your shot to protect yourself every 10 years. I got mine in 2008. It's coming up again. All right? That one is combined with um, diphtheria and whooping cough now, which has been on a, on a rise because of people not getting properly vaccinated. Um, that vaccine for tetanus and diphtheria is actually against the toxins that, are, that cause the debilitating effects of those diseases. They won't stop the growth of the organism. Um, but we have antibiotics for that. It's the toxins you're worried about. You want to be protected against. So when you look at these pictures, right, notice the different temperature for the desktop. Notice the difference in growth. A lot more growth. And where did these organisms probably come from that, that are grown at 37? From us. The 25s are probably from... The environment, because look at the air sample and the desktop. Look at how similar those are, as opposed to the desktop in our fingers. Temperature we know affects. Every organism has a set temperature range, what we call its cardinal temperatures. An absolute minimum, and I got news for you, freezing for us will kill us. Bacteria just stops them, right? It slows their growth, right, when you make them cold. When you warm them back up, obviously, it increases their growth. And like for us, right, uh, there's an optimum growth temperature. Same is true for microorganisms. But if you get too hot, you start destroying proteins, denaturing proteins, and you can actually do what to an organism when you pass their maximum? You can kill them. And that's why we cook our food, right? And that's why certain foods, they suggest a particular temperature because they know the most common pathogens found in that food, potentially, what, how high you've got to go to kill them. Right? That's why those numbers. Okay? Same holds true for us. If we get too hot, we'll die, right? Our body, our normal response to infection is fever, but some microorganisms, particularly bacteria, also produce things that make our fever go even higher. Right? So they, they take over our system, they, they override it, and potentially they can kill us. When you have a fever that just keeps going up and up and up, it's usually a bacterial infection, go to the doctor. Right? Intermediate fever could be virus, and really it's your immune system, then you have to pray to work. So are all organisms within the same temperature bracket? No. We have about five different categories. We're in the middle. We're called mesophiles. So are most of the pathogens that infect us. There are actually some crazy organisms, psychophiles. Psycho actually means cold. They actually love the cold, they live in gla glacial lakes. Of course, we don't really have to worry about them, right? They're not going to survive in us. We're too hot. We would kill them. 
But if they produce toxins in our food, that could be a different story, which is sometimes the case, too, with uh, psychotropes. Some of these guys can cross over into our temperature range. Um, some of them can't. We're too warm. We'll kill them. But if we ingest any of the toxins that they produced, listeria is one of them. Listeria can grow at refrigerator temperatures, which is why pregnant women have to worry, because if you get that infection, it can cross the placenta and kill the baby. Um, if you're immunocompromised, that infection can progress and go to the brain and cause meningitis, right? And that's why, you know, people freak out about listeria. Thermophiles would be in compost heaps, hot springs. Again, I, I don't know any of them that make us sick. We're too cold for them in that case. Hydrothermal vents in the ocean floor is where microorganisms that are classified in this group, your hyperthermophiles, are living. How do we make things sterile? We stick it in the autoclave. The autoclave is high pressure steam, right? So that door locks. The chamber becomes pressurized with steam that can penetrate even through glass to sterilize and kill. Even endospores are destroyed in this environment. Why don't we stick our lab benches in the autoclave? One. I don't know about you, but I don't think we can get that thing even out of here. Our lab bench? You're going to go stick it in the autoclave? Well, they're only used for glass and metal. You can actually put some plastics in them now, too. But we don't really need our desktop. That's We don't need our desktop to be sterile. We need it disinfected. And we physically could not put it in there. It's just not possible. But all the stuff that we work with has been sterilized, right? All the stuff that we grow will be sterilized before it's thrown away. We're not going to contaminate the environment. And we'll use the autoclave to do it. So that brings us to our light microscopes. They're binocular, which means you have two eyepieces to look through. But the ocular apparatus itself only magnifies the image once, not twice. Through that, you see what's produced, which is the virtual image. It kind of floats in space. This is a magnification of the real image that's produced by your ocular lenses. I mean, your objective lenses, too many O's. Oculars you look through, right? Objectives are down by your specimen. They produce the real image. In your stage is your condenser. That lens condenses the light onto your slide and helps focus it into the objective so you can see a clear image. So when we do magnification again, even though there's two oculars, it's only magnifying once, right? So each has a magnification, your ocular. These are compound microscopes, so you're using two sets of lenses, the ocular, and then any one of the objectives that you're using at any one time that you can change between. These are just numbers in your book. Um, mostly so that you know how to figure out total magnification, objective times ocular. I have to say I've never seen a 15x ocular. 10 is the most common, but I have seen 20. These numbers are actually the numbers for our microscopes and the names that we use for the different objective lenses. The scanning objective lens is only four times magnified times the ocular, only a total magnification of 40. That's basically nothing in microbiology. It's a waste of our time most of the time. But we leave our microscope set at that because it gives us the greatest space between our stage and our objective lens. It makes it easier for taking slides on and off without having to get out of focus each time. Low power is typically where you'll start focusing, hence why there's a star. But again, low power, the yellow ring, is only 100 times total magnification. This is pretty much nothing when you're dealing with bacteria. High dry brings us up to 400. We don't use that in this lab because, again, that's not a lot of magnification when you're talking about bacteria. <laughs> also, you probably won't be able to see through any of our high dry lenses because dry means you're not supposed to get oil on it. Students get oil on it. Students don't clean the oil off. The oil creeps into the lens and makes it permanently blurry. So don't bother trying to focus at 40 because you probably will never get there. Right? 
I don't care about the 40s because we really don't need them and I get tired of trying to keep them clean. All I care about is the oil, which the one you have to use oil for and that you will use oil for and that you will clean, otherwise you will clean everyone's microscopes. This is the one that we use all the time for bacteria. This is a thousand times magnified and it's still going to seem teeny tiny. You've got to put oil between the lens and the slide to fill that gap, that teeny tiny gap that you'll have to focus the light so that you can see a clear image. If you do not apply the oil, you'll be focusing forever and never get it in nice, clean, sharp focus. Make sense? So, do we want to actually be able to see what we're looking at? Absolutely. So I'm gonna, it's gonna take me a while to learn names. A beautiful lady in the back. What's your name? Shawanda. Shawanda. Do you need those glasses to see me? No. Not really. Okay. Do you need the glasses to see far? You need them for, for far? For far? Yeah. Okay. Near All right. You're near side. Okay. Learn, but you can see them. And again, we use more than just our eyes to figure out what we're seeing. So he probably calculated this pretty thick. And it's probably pretty. Uh, what's the problem with this? Can I have to use your glasses back on? What's the problem? They're really close together, right? Probably like this, right? You would have got it without those glasses, too. Okay. It has to do with what we call resolution and the limit of resolution. How close can we put them together and we can still see it separately? What determines this is the lenses in your eyes when we're talking about our own vision. And if those lenses cannot adjust accordingly, you actually have muscles that change them. And when you get older like me, they, they don't like to do that quite as well as they used to. Technically, I should wear reading glasses, but I don't read print anymore. I read stuff on the computer and I blow it up. So I don't have to wear the glasses. Mostly because I just forget, you know. I don't need them for anything. But that's also why sometimes, like, you know, you'll get to knowing, like, when you're you're getting old and your eyes are getting tired, right? Because you'll look at something in print, and then you'll go to look at something else, and it's blurry for a second. That's why your eyes, your eyes are adjusting, trying to refocus, right? Because your lens is, is changeable in your eyes. Now, when they correct for that, obviously, with glasses, it's set. And it's what's called a prescription, right? It's given a number value. How they mold that lens so that it can correct for the inaccuracies in your eye. And of course, this changes over time, right? That's why you always have to over check up to make new glasses. Well, our lenses and our microscopes are set, they have a prescription. That number, that prescription, is its numerical aperture. And you can see next to magnification on our objectives, that's your numerical aperture. On the condenser, that's your numerical aperture. And actually, that's the highest it can go if you apply oil, which we will not put oil on our condensers. We don't really need it, and that would be a big mess, not going that route. Uh, we don't need that level of resolution. But resolution means how clearly you can distinguish two objects that are very close to e together as being separate. And we can calculate this mathematically. This will give us our resolving power or limit of resolution. So this is an equation you do need to know. The wavelength is the top of the equation. That is measured in nanometers. So we're actually going to get a distance, y'all. We're going to know a number. How close can we put them together? What's going to determine that is the wavelength of light. The numerical apertures of the objective lens you're using and the condenser, right? How good are you at focusing that light? So the example, and notice that this is a fraction, right? I call fractions evil Siamese twins. They're stuck together. If you don't do the same to both sides, I get mad at you. So let's talk about fractions for a second in terms of we understand, right? So one-sixth of the pie would be this slice, right? Who wants that? All right, who's really hungry? Who wants the five-sixths? Because I didn't eat a big breakfast today. 
Notice the top, right, is the part. The bottom is the whole, right? We could divide this up into six slices of pie. One is a small piece, right? One piece of pie. When the numerator is small, right, it, this whole number is small, right? One-sixth is smaller than five-sixths. You still with me? So when it comes to resolution, what do you think? Do you want a small number or a big number? Small. small, small, because you want to be able to put them like right next to each other and still see them, right? This is the limit of resolution. This says how close can I put them together and you'll still see them as being separate. So you want small. Well, how do we get small if the lenses don't change? What does change in this equation? Wavelength, right? We want to use the smallest possible wavelength of light to get the clearest, best resolution, right? Because those objectives and condenser, those lenses are fixed. You can't change them, unlike our eyes. So, but then, too, we run into the problem we have to stay in the visible light spectrum, right? We have to be able to still see the light to see the image. So in that case, you'll notice that our microscopes have a blue filter. Around 500 nanometers gives us the best resolution. That doesn't mean your specimen's going to look blue. This means that mostly that wavelength of light is passing through to help generate the images that we see. So the fact that we've got to stay in the visible light spectrum this is what limits us with light microscopes as far as resolution goes. Unlike other microscopes that can use things like electrons, which we don't see, so we have computer stuff to help us visualize what the electrons are seeing, atomic force, lasers, all that cool stuff. So we can calculate this. Again, you'll have to calculate it. I do have calculators for you. So if given all the parameters, right, for this example, we end up with a resolution of 347. That means that's as close as we can put them together and you'll still see them as separate. So, if two objects are 130 apart, will we see them? No, they're too close, right? They, they have to be outside that limit, right? 347, they have to be greater than that. In this case, they're less than the resolution you will not discern them as separate. Make sense? So remember, keep thinking that's the minimum distance. If I put them this far apart, I'll see them. If I go in that, you're not going to see them. So in this case... We'll still see them, but one, right? Yeah, they'll blur together. You won't distinguish them. Good question. So now if we change objective lenses, we go to a higher magnification, will also increase resolution we have to. Otherwise, again, you're not going to see. So in this case, with this next objective lens, we get um, a resolution of 248. So if two objects are 250 apart, are we going to see them? That's greater than 248, right? So yeah, just barely, but we're going to see them. So for our microscopes, um, we're typically around 500 nanometers using that blue light filter. Our oil immersion lens and our condenser are 1.25. Um, and this would give us a resolution of 200 nanometers, uh, which is 0.2 micrometers, which is about the size of a bacteria. Hence why we will be able to see that you are looking at more than one. They won't blur together. Uh, with our eyes, we can only see uh, about 100 mic micrometers, which would be one hundredth of a, a millimeter. So on a millimeter ruler, I mean one-tenth of a millimeter. So some people, not me, can imagine 10 lines in between these little lines, if I can see to that level. Huh. The good news in this class, we will only measure in millimeters. <laughs> we won't go any smaller than that, right? So each one of these little lines. But so just to give you an idea, our microscopes are 500 times more powerful than our eyes at our highest magnification. 
So these are some examples of some of the things you'll see. These are bacteria, rod-shaped bacteria in chains. They stay next to each other in these long chains. This is yeast. These guys are pretty tiny too, even though they're eukaryotic. So we look at them at oil immersion, which all these images were. This is a red blood cell. These are some staphylococci bacteria. They're little spherical shaped and they're actually in clusters, in little grape-like clusters. Um, that's how come I know they're staphylococci. Um, so someone might have a, a staph infection of their blood. That's probably what this sample is. So really not good bacterial infection of your blood. So we will use bright field microscopy in this class where the background is bright, right? Your images we will stain or they'll come stained so that it'll help you visualize them. Dark field microscopy is where the background, as you can see, is dark. We could do this with our microscopes. You turn off the light from below and you would shine it at an angle. And so the background's dark and the organisms illuminate. We don't bother with that in this lab. I would really love, and that's my next grant I'm going to write, is a phase microscopy. Um, this, uses a, this uses our same light microscopes, but with additional filters that knock the wavelengths of light out of phase with each other, and this helps create contrast. So in comparison here, you can see bright field, dark field, and this is phase contrast. Do you guys see all the little things outside? You can see you have better resolution. Um, and you have better resolution without staining, too. You can create contrast without staining. Um, there's subtle um, differences, much more pronounced between light and dark. Um, this is a euglena, and these are probably other little tiny bacteria even outside that it's eating. Fluorescent microscopy is very popular nowadays as well. Some microorganisms naturally fluoresce, and actually one of the bacteria we work with produces a green pigment that's fluorescent. So when you shine UV light on it, it glows blue. We're going to make glowing E. coli this semester too. We won't look at them under the microscope because we don't have fluorescent microscopy. You would need a, uh, a microscope set up with UV light and special filters so you wouldn't damage your eyes. Using stains that are fluorescent is very popular now, right, where they can use specific stains to stain specific components of cells. So I have a beautiful picture poster in my office because they won't let us put posters outside of our office anymore. So my office, which some of you guys may have walked by, is over in the cubicle land. It's the only one with the blue roof because I have the HEPA filter in there because the construction was killing me. Um, so I have a couple posters down at the bottom in my windows that aren't taped to the outside. So we'll see how long before they come by and tell me to move those too. I don't, I don't like it. You know, it doesn't feel like home away from home anymore. Inside my office, you'll see posters. And in the lab, you can see, right, posters that my students have generated uh, over the years about the really cool microbiology stuff that we deal with uh, and of interest to my students. So, and I have really cool pictures in my office of fluorescent microscopy as well. Really pretty stuff. So for next time, remember on Canvas, it'll help you out. There's that quiz, right? Go ahead and do it. You can do it multiple times. Even though it says 10 points, it's just a practice quiz. It's not going to go in the grade book, y'all. Um, <laughs> but I, I put it, the points there to kind of help you get a gauge of how you're doing. Um, here's the lecture I just presented um, for you. I'll put a link on this page as well. I'll put a link down here to the recording that I'm doing right now as well. Um, and there's a list to remind you of what you need to do. So one of the other things I want you to do is watch my um, video. The audio visual department did a professional one. They didn't edit it really good, so they're supposed to come back and do another one. But this is my just run through one. It's good though. So it's not the really good one, but it's good. Um, so watch that. Um, review this lecture, the homework, right? Study your terms. Take the quiz online. There's even the link. Do your homework for next time, which is reading 3-3, filling in all the blanks on this handout. Draw all your pictures. Remember, I put a copy of the textbook of, the, of that um, exercise 3-3 so you can do your homework right here online. Uh, study for your quiz on lab one. 
And again, the PowerPoint uh, will be posted here as well as under the, this module link in this recording.